You may have noticed my slight limp. Did it get your attention? Yes? Okay, glad that joke worked. Just kidding, I'm actually injured. Um, and also, I'm not sure who stole my dance moves earlier. I did not give permission to show that video, but that's another problem. As soon as we crossed from Peru into Bolivia, I looked down at my cell phone, and I realized it lost service. And I thought, oh crap. We kept going, we got to the dock, and we boarded the boat, we were set sail, we were setting sail onto Lake Titicaca, which yes, is a real place, and it borders both Peru and Bolivia. And when I say that we were gonna go visit one of the islands on the lake, if you're thinking Hawaii, kind of lower your standards by about 100. <laughs> and so we're out on the boat, this lake looks like an ocean, it's huge, it's massive. About halfway out, we realize this is the last boat out. There's no other boats coming back. We're going to have to spend the night on the island. And that's when I thought, oh, crap. Because, see, I had told my mom that we were going to leave our place in Peru, we were going to go to Bolivia for the day, and we were going to come back. And now I knew I screwed everything up. And my mom had a 22-year-old son wandering aimlessly in South America, me being that son. <laughs> And we get to the island. I'm like, okay, now i got to put some sort of plan in place here. So I started asking around, is there any place on this island that has cell phone service? And they're like, yeah, you can hike about 30 minutes that way, maybe get some service. So I hike, I schlub over 30 minutes, get a little bit of cell phone service, enough to call my local boss back in Peru. I say, Javier, you got to email my mom. Our plans have changed. It's, we're going to spend the night here. Javier says, okay, okay, what's her email address? I spell out my mom's email address. He says, okay, I'll email her. I'll tell her your plans have changed. Hang up. I feel a little better at this point. Go see the island, have a good time, go to bed, take the first boat back. Finally get back to town, and I get cell phone service, and this is when I realized all hell had broken loose. I had calls, emails, texts, voicemails, and I knew I was in trouble. Because my mom basically thought we died in Bolivia that night day. <laughs> and so I said, okay, oh boy. So I called my mom, got in touch with her. I was like, we're okay. I'm so sorry. Our, change, our plans have changed and so forth. And later I came to find out that she had literally kept herself worried sick up all night. I also came to find out that my boss misspelled her email address by one letter. There's two N's in Wiseman. Whoops. So this story this evolution of this sort of journey and getting in trouble in Peru is important to me because I was, am, and always will be a mama's boy. <laughs> You're laughing. Great. <laughs> Maybe when you hear a grown man on stage say that he's a mama's boy, a certain image comes to your head, right? You think, well, that guy, all the men in the audience, are like, that guy's not tough. Well, I've done some pretty tough things in my life. I've swam in the Amazon, which I'm convinced years later gave me a full body rash. I've gone piranha fishing. I played college basketball. I tore my Achilles, real tough. It's a real injury. And I even found a smoking hot wife who's here tonight. And I'm so glad she decided to put a bra on. <laughs> now, maybe, now, maybe everybody in the room is thinking, Okay, well, he's not manly enough, right? He's a mama's boy. Well, for my brother and I, it actually started when we were quite young because my dad invented a little game called Dump and Run. Like any good dad, he had a huge pile of dirt delivered to the front of our house. And we had to move said pile of dirt from the front of the house to the back of the house. So my dad came up with a game called Dump and Run. My brother and I, we got our little Fisher Price wheelbarrows. We loaded them up, and we, we were guys, guys, right? We could probably only hold about two cups worth of dirt. <laughs> and my dad would yell, dump and run, and we'd go running off to the backyard <laughs> as fast as we could. We'd dump the little dirt, and we'd come running back. Now, as, I don't know, four, six, seven-year-olds, this was great. I'm pretty sure it falls under some sort of weird, weird child labor laws, but that's another story. 
Now, maybe for you women in the audience, when you hear a man say he's a mama's boy, maybe you think I'm not independent, can't take care of myself. Well, I'm here to tell you, I can make a mean stir fry. I went away to college. As you know, I lived in South America. And I have even am so independent that I once got lost in a grocery store. <laughs> and a Best Buy. Now, what interests me about this term, mama's boy, having been one, and am one, is its evolution over time. If you think about it, any man who comes into this world, attachment theory teaches us that you are actually literally attached to the person providing care for you. That's why we cry when we need food as infants, because somebody has to provide that nourishment for you. Nature's hard at work to ensure you receive proper nurture. Then, over time, as a boy kind of comes into childhood, middle age, this notion of mama's boy shifts. And you start to understand it's got a negative connotation to it. I can remember in the third grade being called a mama's boy for the first time, one of many. And I thought, so? I like my mom. She's pretty funny. And we spent a lot of time together. I don't get it. Then I realized, oh, they mean I'm not tough enough. I'm not cool to have this close relationship with my mom. At the same time, the third grader in me is thinking, if I come to school with pants on and shoes tied, it's a win. And so you start to realize that we're teaching our young boys to distance themselves from the women in their relationship. Society, culture, it's not cool. They're not tough enough. Then later in life, Mama's Boys continues to evolve. You hear about women and men who seek out men as partners who have strong relationships with the women in their lives. We admire them. We think they make better husbands and could make better fathers. And you even see pop culture and society change too. You hear NBA players get up on stage and give wonderful uh, award speeches, thanking and saying, you know, we, we came through this together, Mom, we did it. And we love that. We eat it up. We're like, oh my gosh, what a great guy. He and his mom got through it. So Mama's Boy is, this, is almost coming full circle. So I was pretty fortunate to have a really special relationship with my mom. So special, in fact, that one time I convinced her to watch some Robin Williams stand up with me. Most of you probably know Robin Williams. He's a little vulgar. But in this particular uh, bit that I wanted to show my mom was Robin Williams describing the building of the male and female reproductive systems by committee. And he is said committee. If you haven't watched it, please go home and YouTube it. It'll be the best thing you learned here tonight. And so my mom's like, fine, Zach, we can watch it. I'm like, okay, we'll put it on your iPad, we'll put in headphones. <laughs> so no one can see, no one can hear. She finally agrees. She's like, sure, but you can't laugh. Well, as an aside, anybody who knows me, I'm the guy who, if I'm alone in the hotel room, I'm laughing out loud watching TV. So this is a pretty impossible task. I'm like, sure, oh yeah, I won't laugh. We start playing the video, and of course, 10 seconds in, I'm laughing, I'm smiling, <laughs> you know, spitting up. And my mom's poking me, like, shh, stop it. I'm like, shh. Well, she did thousands and thousands of times. Finally get through the video. It was hilarious. But it was at this exact moment then I realized things were a little different. My mom, my dad, and I were sitting in the cancer center at MD Anderson. About a month earlier, my mom had been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. So I realized I was a mama's boy, but it was at this exact moment I realized I was now a caregiver. Whole different beast. How many of you tonight have ever cared for a loved one? I'm sure I'm not the only one. Caregiving, kind of similar to Mama's Boy, has this journey and evolution over our lives. Again, attachment theory teaches us that we come into this world and we need care. We are dependent on someone else to provide care for us. It is fundamental to our survival. Then, in sort of the middle stages of our life, at different times for everybody, we're offered chances to provide care for somebody else. And so, then, later in life, Somewhat, if we're lucky enough, we're going to need care ourselves. And so you start out needing care, you're presented with chances to give care, 
and then you ultimately need it yourself. It comes full circle again. Now, caregiving, tough. Caregiving is disruptive. Caregiving doesn't give a crap what day of the week it is, how much money you have in your bank account, where you think you are in your prof professional or personal journeys. Caregiving takes mortality that we like to keep next door and brings it in the room. And there's no roadmap to caregiving. I have a good friend who's here tonight, and he likes to tell a famous story that I think summarizes some of the difficult decisions that caregiving can thrust us into when we're never ready. He was on a train platform in New York, standing with his boss. And his boss said, Richard, I know you're caring for your mom. You've got two choices. You can either keep working or you can go care for your mom. And that's a pretty difficult decision, right? And he chose to care for his mom. And he went on to care for his mom and has since published a book on caregiving to help us navigate and to help start building this roadmap. At the same time with caregiving, there's lots of different roles that we can fill, and maybe some of you have experience with that. In our family's example, you know, I was able to come be by my mom's side. My brother and I tried to make things light and fun, and that's us wearing our mom's wigs. He came in and, in and out of town. He lived elsewhere. My dad kept the family business afloat and cared on nights and weekends and everything in between. We had family friends come over constantly. We were all filling these different roles. Similarly, I learned that as a millennial, as much as I like to deny that I'm a millennial, that, that, that we grew up as secondhand caregivers. My wife and I, when we started dating, we had six grandparents all in the ages of 80 and above. Pretty fortunate on that front. But we spent a lot of time in assisted living facilities, nursing homes, watching our parents care for their parents, and learning and helping where we could. And at the same time, you have, of course, an aging baby boomer population. This population, of course, is going to make many of us caregivers, if not already. So it's on the horizon. It's here, if not again already. Now, for me, being a mama's boy made the transition to caregiver a no-brainer. I had a close, healthy relationship with my mom, so watching her give care for her family and others was like, of course, I'll be there. I'll do what I can. But again, if you think about the differences and the similarities between being a mama's boy and being close with people, in this case women, and caregiving, they have these similar evolutions that we just discussed, but they also have negative social and society contexts. We don't think of caregiving as a cool, fun thing to do. We think of it often as a burden. And so I'm interested and have been looking at the impacts that this has on our young boys, teaching them. What are we teaching them about distancing themselves at an early age from the women in their lives, from love, from empathy, from compassion? So what if we start to redefine what it means to be a mama's boy, to be a man, to be tough, to give care? What if we redefine how we view as a culture and a society toughness and courage and masculinity? My mom had four months and passed away at the age of 60. And watching what she did and how she fought, that's toughness, that's courage. And so I'm asking all of us tonight, let's not stop at loss. Let's continue on. Let's come together and pick each other up and build off of past experiences. Watching my father carry on our family business day in and day out, that's toughness, that's courage. Not swimming in the Amazon. And so I'm extremely interested in how we carry on these different legacies and fight social pressures and social constructs that we've created. So I want us to raise young boys who are close with the women in their life and let them know that that's okay. They can still be tough. They can still do some fun, cool things. Close to their moms, close to their sisters. If they have two daddies, close to them too. Because I think if we all start to raise these young mama's boys in healthy, strong relationships, what we're also going to be doing is we're going to be creating the next generation of amazing caregivers. Men who are able to step up to the plate when caregiving comes calling at any time. I'll never forget, it was 
I, I think it was my first haircut, but that seems a little too young, so I don't know. It was an early haircut. And my mom took me to a place called Cole and Sons. That's, uh, it's pretty well known in the, in the Metroplex. And I was a pain in the ass. I cried the whole time. I was kicking and screaming. The people at Cole and Sons at some point told my mom, don't ever bring this kid back. He's banned for life. And we get in the car. And my mom says to me, I'm sure I'm crying and like eating a lollipop, says, you know what, Z, they're not worthy of cutting your hair. And to this day, I have never stepped foot in a Colwell and Sons, <laughs> and I never will, because I'm a mama's boy. Thank you.